Right. <clears throat> I'm going to call to order the Monday, October 7th meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, being covered by ACMI. Probably have a full house tonight, so find seats where you can. Uh, first up before item number one is we have uh, a couple of administrative changes to handle. There were two public hearings initially on the docket for this evening. Uh, we had 833 Mass Ave continuing continue to November uh, 4th. Fourth. Fourth. Yeah. <clears throat> so hear that. And then uh, 93 Broadway was withdrawn without prejudice. And the hotel project at 1207, 1211 Mass Ave let us know that they would not be back until sometime in December, December 16th. All take place, so we need to continue each of those. Well, we need to continue uh, the original eight, the 833 Mass Ave special permit discussion, even though we have a meeting with the, the owner. So I'll move to do that. So, motion okay. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we will move uh, 1207 1211 Mass Ave to December 16th at 7 30. I'll, I'll make that motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. All right, so um, we'll begin with item number one, which is a discussion with the property owner at 833 Mass Ave. And so, Mr. Anessi, please yes. introduce yourself and your clients. Uh, Robert Anessi for Mr. Noyes, who is here. He uh, uh, flew in from Kansas City, arrived at the airport at 5.30, got a rental car, and got over here as quickly as he could. Uh, we know that this property has been a, in a, a tough uh, condition for an extended period of time. I have been retained by Mr. Noyes uh, to uh, go ahead with uh, some uh, development uh, uh, ideas as far as the property is concerned. Uh, we basically have talked to the building inspector. I've gotten some history from the building inspector, and by the way, I have a personal history because I went to high school in the 1950s in this town, and Noyes Buick was an active uh, operation at that point, and uh, the Atwood House existed at that point. There's no question about that. Uh, what we uh, would like to do, and I know that there have been complaints that have been filed uh, with the police department because of uh, youngsters getting into the building, because the building has been abandoned. Part of the problem has been that Mr. Noyes has not been in a position to do anything until he wrapped up his father's estate, which got wrapped up one month ago. So economically, he's now in a position to move along. Uh, I have retained, and I'm going to retain, the services of an architect. He's coming in to see me on Thursday with my client, Mr. Noyes. Uh, that architect uh, is Monte French. Monte French, you may recall, is the architect who did Arlington Animal Clinic. I wanted to get an architect who is familiar with the procedure in town so we can thoroughly investigate the possibilities as far as the property is concerned. Now, I visited the property with you, Ken, uh, some time ago, some, some months ago, as a matter of year. fact. Yeah. And uh, we were all concerned about falling through the floor and other issues uh, with respect to the condition of the building. Uh, the, there is a report which I've, gave, uh, I've given to Jenny Ray from an architect that the building department got about a year ago from uh, a structural engineer who went into the building, looked at the building, and basically said that uh, it's in a, in a very tough shape. Uh, he basically said, I can't open up the walls, I can't take down the ceilings, so I can't really get into that part of it, but he does opine that in his opinion, not having done that by the way, not having taken out the walls, not having taken down the ceiling, he does opine that the structural aspects of the building uh, would appear to be uh, okay. Well, we're not going to accept that, okay? What we're going to do uh, in conjunction with the, the architect we're going to have our own structural inspector go in and we're going to have him take a look at the structure to see whether in fact the structure is uh, okay for, f uh, for basically rehabbing the building. Now that's said in the context of the ARB decision that talks uh, talked about 
uh, the building, uh, the Atwood building, uh, being rehabbed uh, rather than uh, being demolished. There was one comment in the ARB decision toward the end uh, that talked about the fact that if uh, the client wanted to come back before the ARB to take down the building, uh, he could not do so within 24 months of the time that the ARB de uh, decision was rendered, which was 2009. So we're now at a point where we're prepared to go, we're prepared to do whatever we have to. Uh, if we need to rehab the building for the purpose of going multi-use with the building, we're prepared to do that. Uh, uh, that would contemplate some sort of office use on the first level, uh, start, start that retail use on the first level, and residential uh, perhaps above for a couple of levels. We're prepared to do that. But before we do that, as I say, and I've talked to my client about this, he does want to have an additional structural inspection done. And I think that's fair, okay? I think the architect is going to insist on that. Uh, you folks are probably going to look at the ARB decision that, that was rendered in 2009 where it seems to indicate that uh, uh, they would like to see the Atwood building remain intact, okay, uh, and be rehabbed. But again, we're open to any ideas that may, uh, that may develop here uh, in terms of what we can do. Uh, so uh, Jeff is here. Uh, I know that you've been trying to have Jeff come in for some time. Uh, and uh, I do know that uh, I, I said to Jeff, you're going to hear some comments about the fact that the building has been abandoned, OK? And that no action has been taken with respect to taking steps to rehab or whatever. Uh, so he's prepared for that, okay, uh, and we're open to a discussion at this point. Uh, we're open to suggestions if you have them, okay, in terms of what can be done as far as the site is concerned. You may recall that the ARB decision uh, in contemplation of the Atwood House remaining up uh, basically provided for 10 parking spaces. It also provided for the near area behind the Atwood building so that uh, an addition could be uh, uh, added to the building behind the Atwood building if it, if it stayed up. So again, I'm not here to say to you that we want to take the building down. What I'm here to say to you is we need to have a structural inspection done before we know what we can or cannot done. I know there's been one by inspectional, but I was in there myself, and uh, I must tell you that the building is in tough shape. So, Jeff, do you want to add anything to what I've said? I, I, that was very well said. Uh, please. Um, uh, we're open to suggestions. We're not interested in having this thing fester at this point. I've been retained. He's paying me money. He's going to be paying the architect money. Uh, this thing is not going to fester. We're here to move it along. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Noyes, for, for coming this evening. I know Ken had some questions, so I'll well, begin with him. Thank you for coming in and yeah. uh, addressing this issue for us. It's, it's been 10 years since we approved the project, uh, the CBS project, and uh, you're totally correct. Um, there was a, a, a two-year moratorium at the decision to maintain the house as is, okay? Um, I'm not here to say you can't, cannot do anything. We're here to encourage you to do something with it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's right on Mass Ave. It's next to the high school. It's, it's in downtown center area. It, it just, uh, it's been a nuisance and it's been attracting the wrong elements next yeah, to I, the school. I, I started okay. this process and then unfortunately lost my dad. And, and I'm sorry to hear about that. And, and uh, I got sidetracked yeah. for a year, but now we're back. But um, I just want to say that, you know, us as the board, well, me personally, but uh, you know, we're encouraging whatever we can do to help you move this along. Okay. We want to do that. We're not here to hinder you from moving it along, okay? That's we're great. glad to hear that uh, you want to do something with it. Um, I'm just saying that there's many opportunities. Uh, I saw one that's uh, right in Cambridge, right on Mass Ave, next to the school where they uh, kept the front of the building more or less where it was and built the whole building behind it. Mm -hmm. They lifted it up. Yeah, I'm not saying that's what you have to do, but I'm saying that was quite amazing. Yeah, I'm not sure the, this is the room and size and, and what you want to do, but I'm saying there's many opportunities. They were, the, we're willing to work with you in a way, you know, somewhat keep the character of the house, if so. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not in the same position you are. I walked the house that day with you two, with uh, with Mike Burns, uh, the building commissioner. And uh, the skin of the building is in tough shape, but the structure, the bones of the building, in my opinion, was in pretty good shape. The foundation was solid; nothing was crumbling. There's no water in the uh, basement. Um, the walls weren't open, <coughs> but they seemed pretty solid. I'm not going to say that aren't, aren't. I'm not going to argue with you. It, just, sure. it is what it is. I respect your, uh, um, you, you come with an architect that's going to, you know, say it, it, it is what it is. Uh, and, you know, we can go forward with there. Okay. Um, I mean, town officials are going to tell us whether we're right or wrong on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not here to, The fact yeah. that we come up with something that says the structure is not good, that doesn't mean that we're going to prevail. Oh, just, uh, no. We know no. that. Yes. Yeah. But I'm just staying here. Sure. That, you know, yeah. Thank you for coming in, and we're willing to work with you and encourage you to move that along in anything that uh, that's. And that we, we intend to do that. Absolutely. Okay. Much yeah. appreciated. Yeah. 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 I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh, if you can, in the meantime, there's still some windows and things that sort of can, can do a reboarding. Yeah. yeah. If you can do that, uh, it'd be nice. Um, it's getting cold, and you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's sheltered space, and I know there's a lot of uh, old mattresses and, well, you've been in there, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm not going to go over that stuff that yeah. we found inside there, but if you can just reboard back up again, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other comments? David, Rachel? Not no. for me. No, we do appreciate you coming in. Hopefully it doesn't take 10 years to see you again. You'll be hearing from us many know. times, I'm sure, <laughs> on this one. Okay. All right. So. Mr. Chair, is you good? Yes, we're still ready. Is this a public hearing? I'm it is not, no. I'm confused because your agenda says it's a public hearing, but it also says it's moved to November 4th. The public hearing request is for the CVS project. Uh, this was a separate agenda item related to the same address. This is not a public hearing. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, I would say I hope you have the um, special permit because I think what mm -hmm. Mr. Ernesti represented wasn't quite correct. I was on the redevelopment board at the time and there was a clear intent to maintain that house. And what the decision says is the ARB wouldn't even consider a request to tear it down uh, within the two years of the date that decision was made. And, and furthermore, should you go in that direction, you must reopen the special permit, you must advertise it, and allow public comment. Yeah. I'm sure we'll do that when the time comes. Thank you for thank your you. input. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, <coughs> our next agenda item is the uh, <coughs> housing <coughs> meeting, and I'm told that the town meeting town manager will be here precisely at eight. So, uh, I think what I'll do is move things around a little bit, see if we can't fill the next 15 minutes uh, while we wait for the town manager. So, uh, first, I'll move the meeting minutes up from September 9th. I realize that won't take too, too much time, but uh, if there are any questions or comments on that, we can take a look at those now and see whether there are any amendments to be made. Rachel, I'll start with you. I did not have any. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, I had one comment. Oh, it just popped up. Uh, in the paragraph of my comments at the bottom of page, one, mm -hmm. there was a grammatical issue in the third sentence. Mr. Watson said the board may consider requiring the applicant to install bike mm -hmm. parking. Mm -hmm. I think that should be as a condition of the special permit, mm -hmm. is what we were talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Anything else? I have no issues. I have nothing. To approve those. A motion to approve meeting minutes uh, for September 9th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. All right. Um. Um, I don't think, I don't, the Heights one, we told those individuals to be here at 9. Okay. So I don't know if there's anything you could do about that. So we may need to break. Before we can. All right, so we'll take a recess for about 10 minutes. And then start and when, then when Adam arrives. Just before 8 o'clock when the town manager arrives. Okay. 
think that's the best. Okay. It, we might actually have both of the oh, we do? folks here. They I see Rob. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. Do we have Jason? No. No. Okay. Just no. Rob. Just Rob. Yeah. All right. So we'll yeah. take so a brief I, recess and go off the you. record until then. All right. Thank you, Walter. All right. So we're back on <clears throat> now. I want to thank the town manager for coming to join us this evening. I know his <coughs> time is limited, so I'm going to hand it over to uh, him and Jenny Rate to give us their presentation. And we'll go into, uh, we have some speakers that have requested time, and then I'll allow for brief comments. But understanding that the town manager's time is limited, uh, we're going to keep it to a pretty short uh, timing leash tonight of three minutes per speaker <coughs> after the first two that sent us materials ahead of time. So, yeah. Please do you have any proceed. No, I, just to say, first of all, thank you. I know that it's been a, quite a process to get us to be able to have this presentation. I'm sorry that Jean Benson couldn't be here tonight to be with us and, and to hear this, um, and also the conversation that will follow. But I, I very much appreciate the board continuing to have the conversation, and for all of the people in the room who also want to continue the conversation for different reasons. I'm very much looking forward to that, and I think. We are not exactly picking up where we left off in the spring. We are looking for to inform this entire discussion and to also continue that dialogue throughout the community and other conversations, which we'll talk about eventually about the engagement process. So I just want to say I appreciate it. I appreciate Adam's time and attention to this issue and look forward to the dialogue. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. I'll, 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 I, I guess I'll, I'll talk in this direction. But, uh, Thank you for asking. Do my best. Uh, so, so like Jenny said, um, obviously this board, Jenny and her team did a lot of work last year on issues of housing. There were proposals brought before town meeting aimed at uh, housing production um, that uh, didn't go very far. Just being blunt. And as we took a look at uh, took a look at the issues, we thought it would be good to start talking about why. Why, why are we talking about these issues? Uh, these issues. Why is it important for Arlington, uh, and and why why should we be thinking about it? So, like Jenny mentioned, we uh, we gave a very similar, if not the exact same, presentation to the select board uh, back over the summer. We now want to talk about this issue here tonight, and we really want this to be the, the launching pad for a broader community discussion about why issues of housing are important in Arlington and what potential solutions might be for the stresses or the housing stresses that people are feeling, either living in Arlington or desiring to live in Arlington. So uh, to start, am I doing this? Is that? I can also do it okay. if you want me to. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, some regional issues and projections. You know, we, Arlington is obviously five and a half square miles. We're surrounded by our borders and we, we the Arlington community is very much a very identifiable, recognizable community, but we're part of a region, right? We're part of a regional economy, part of a regional housing market that impacts Arlington. So we need to think about ourselves and what's right for us, but we also need to understand that we're operating as part of a larger ecosystem. So we want to look at some of those projections, see what's happening in the region, then we want to dial it in and look at what are some of the impacts in Arlington, what's actually happening uh, from a statistical point of view on the ground in Arlington. We then want to look at what some potential solutions might be. Uh, we want to talk about current efforts or past and current efforts the town has undertaken. We want to talk about the work that the Metro Mayor's Coalition has done. And we want to talk about some potential tools from a broad-based point of view uh, that we can use to start addressing these, these housing crunches, this, this housing crisis in Arlington. And then talk about next steps. So this first slide looks uh, historically at growth in the Metro Mayor's Coalition region. So that's 15 communities in the greater Boston area. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I, won't, I won't list them off, but Metro Mayor's Coalition, 15 communities in the greater Boston area. What, what have we seen over the past, uh, you know, better part of the past decade? We've seen tremendous job growth. We've seen corresponding population growth. Uh, but frankly, we've seen a limited number of housing units permitted during that time period. So the obvious impact of that is that home prices in Massachusetts are surging. We've probably all felt it, or our families have felt it. Uh, housing is becoming more and more expensive, and that's because demand is far outpacing supply uh, in terms of availability of housing, especially in the greater Boston region. What does that mean from a more granular point of view? It means that a lot of households, especially households that are on the lower end of the income bracket, are cost burdened. 
So you can see uh, to the left, you see households uh, by ownership who are experiencing cost burden, <coughs> and household and to the right, households that are experiencing um, burden who are renters. So you can see people that are closer to the top of the income brackets aren't necessarily feeling uh, a high degree of cost burden. But as you start to go down the levels of income, and you see, see the yellows and the green, you start to see that there's large po uh, portions of the population that are experiencing cost burden. What cost burden means is, in the yellow, just being burdened means you're spending more than 30% of your income on housing. <coughs> if you're severely burdened, you're spending more than 50% of your income on housing. Uh, again, on the renter column, you can see there's a lot of people. There's a significant amount of people in those lower income brackets that are severely cost burdened living in this region. So <coughs> what do we see going forward? We see the growth in the economy continuing meaning there's more jobs coming in, uh, meaning more people will be moving in. We see seniors and non-working households staying in the region and not, <coughs> not moving away sort of one for one with people moving into the region, uh, wanting to work. And we also look at what uh, economists say is a healthy uh, va uh, vacancy rate that can keep uh, a healthy, affordable market. So you look at, you look at this, we're, we're predicting, or the, the work of the Metro Mayor's Coalition and the Metropolitan Area Planning Council is predicting that between 2015, some of this has already happened, and 2030, we have a significant number of new housing units needed to meet this demand, 185,000 units. So what about Arlington? What is this, what are we seeing in Arlington? So we're seeing that Arlington has a significant number of its households um, are, are people with low incomes. 2,100 households, 11% of all households have extremely low incomes in Arlington. So I, Arlington's uh, you know, often talked about how much it's gentrifying, and it certainly is, and how it's becoming a more affluent community, and it certainly is becoming a more affluent community. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people in Arlington um, that are, are still financially struggling. We also hear a lot of talk from all people about how we want to maintain Arlington's economic diversity. I myself feel like one of the best things about Arlington is its economic diversity. Uh, the people that you live in, live in your neighborhood, uh, the families that you meet uh, with your children attending school, it's great that we have um, economic diversity. Maintaining economic diversity means maintaining affordability in housing, and that's, a, and I think, an important thing for us to think about throughout this discussion. So what else are we seeing in Arlington? We're seeing 30% of household, uh, households are cost burdened, so one in three spend more than 30% of their income on housing. In Arlington, so the region is seeing struggles. We're seeing struggles here in Arlington in terms of how many people are cost burdened. Even more so, we're seeing low-income seniors uh, spend even a higher proportion of their income on housing. So we're seeing um, seniors, 972 low-income senior households are spending more than 50% of their income on housing costs. So those are Arlington residents really struggling <coughs> to make ends meet, primarily driven by higher and higher housing costs in Arlington. Again, over to the right, you can see another depiction of some of the more broad charts we looked at before. Housing prices are rising faster than income. So none, none of this should be a surprise that we're facing these challenges, right? If, if prices are going up faster than people's incomes are rising, pressure mounts, and we have an affordability challenge. Down below, I, I kept going back and forth both before the select board as well as coming here tonight of what exactly point we're trying to make with talking about how many rental units were converted to condos. And ultimately, th the point is, um, these are mostly apartments and two families that are being converted to condos. And from a tax base point of view, that's good. The, the town likes that. When a, an apartment, a two family turns into condos, that is new growth to our tax base. The problem is, it's likely that those apartments are going from what are somewhat affordable, maybe what we call naturally occurring affordable housing in the community, to becoming luxury condos. So we see that's happening at a very fast rate between 2000 and 2014. Jenny, I don't know if you recall yeah. the number between 2014 it's and another now. 300 units at least that it converted. So we see that happening pretty rapidly in Arlington. And I, Through 2017. I don't have a, a solution to that tonight, but I, I think it's an important thing for us to remember in terms of what we're, what we're losing from affordability in the current housing stock. Mm -hmm. um, before I get to this slide, we, we, we lost a slide. I, yeah, I, I do want to highlight, as we move into the, the solutions, what, what can we do? I think it's important to talk about all the things the town has done. Um, 
the select board and via permit issuance, uh, the ARB has supported the housing corporation's efforts at Downing Square and Broadway. So there's 57 units of a completely affordable housing in the development pipeline. I think it's important to recognize those efforts. Um, the select board continues to support the allegation of CDBG and CPA and home funding for affordable unit uh, production and preservation. And, and that's uh, really spurred forward by uh, the efforts of Jenny and her team. The town continues to support uh, the weatherization program that allows people to try to uh, tighten up their homes and get uh, become more energy efficient so that they can stay in their homes, have their utilities be more affordable. Uh, we have ongoing preservation efforts with the Housing Corporation and the Arlington Housing Authority trying to maintain affordable housing in the community. Uh, we are constantly monitoring the existing subsidized housing inventory uh, to make sure that anything that's on there can stay on there. If there's things that are at risk of slipping off, that if there is things that we can do in our power to keep them on the subsidized housing inventory, that we try to put ourselves in a position to do it. And finally, this board, other boards have been <coughs> continually working on the implementation of the master plan and the housing production plan. So there's been a lot of good efforts to date already, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. <coughs> Shifting a little bit and talking about solutions, um, talked about the Metro Mayor's Coalition at the start. So again, here's the actual listing of the communities that are members of the Metro Mayor's Coalition. Represent 1.4 uh, million residents in the region. And they, they've really, this group has worked on a number of things. It's worked on climate preparedness. It's still working on that. It's worked on, uh, worked on the opioid epidemic. And now it's also working on this regional housing partnership. So as I mentioned earlier, um, they've set a goal of producing 185,000 units in the region by 2030. Boston has set a goal of uh, building 69,000, is that the right number? Yeah. 69,000 units by 2030, and there's actually a piece, I think, in the Commonwealth Magazine talking about Boston being well on track to meet that goal uh, by 2030. And um, I think it's important to mention, I, I know I've heard some concern in the community that if you just proportionately look at each community that meeting that 185,000 unit goal would mean Arlington would need to develop nearly 7,000 new units uh, by 2030. And I can tell you with absolutely no hesitation that is not at all how this regional housing partnership is working. Boston is the only one that I believe has set a clear goal. Mm -hmm. Cambridge hasn't mm -hmm. set a goal Somerville. yet. Uh, Summer, so Somerville has set a goal. Every other community has been asked to have dialogues like we're having to talk about whether or not, A, we want to set a numbers goal, and if we do, what that number is. There's no mandate, there's no prescription, there's no one yelling at Arlington to build 7,000 households. Uh, that is not at all how this is working. It's a collaborative effort, acknowledging an issue in the region, and every community trying to do its share, in defining its share, to try to address that concern. So what are some of the things we can look at? Some of these are obviously very familiar to you. Um, we can look at amendments to the inclusionary zoning bylaw, as was discussed at town meeting last year. Uh, we can continue to look at whether or not creating housing along the commercial corridors uh, in the mixed use zones are, is appropriate. Uh, we can look at whether or not there is a different uh, look at the accessory dwelling units uh, as opposed to last year. That could be more attractive to town meeting, looking at whether or not we want to consider potential age and family restrictions. And I think overarchingly, we heard loud and clear last year, and I think this is important to me and the town as a whole with our net zero planning efforts and our uh, vulnerability preparedness efforts, we want to make sure that anything we talk about in terms of housing production looks at stormwater issues, looks at climate resiliency, so that we're looking at this very holistically um, with any of this work that we're trying to do. This was the other one that got left off. On the select board's presentation. Um, yeah. So, and, and there there are other tools that we can start to look at um, that are outside of zoning. Um, the, the zoning is obviously part of it, but it's not all about zoning. Uh, there's uh, uh, displacement protection issues we can look at. Um, I don't know that we want to have a rent and control discussion, but I know a lot of other communities uh, in the region are starting to wonder whether or not that's something to talk about. So, there are other tools we can start to think about as a town as this dialogue moves forward. So what are the next steps? Um, we spoke to the select board in the summer. We're here tonight. We're trying to set a date either later this month or sometime, sometime this fall for the select board and the ARB to hold a joint meeting to talk about these issues together. Uh, we want to have public engagement starting really now and throughout this process. 
And we're hoping that we can, through this public engagement, through conversations with the ARB and the select board, mm -hmm. we can start to put together strategies that um, a larger amount of people want to pursue. Uh, probably, you know, we said late fall, early winter when we sat with the select board. I think we're thinking more of this conversation taking place over the winter, through the spring, and if there were recommendations we wanted to bring forward, not thinking about bringing them forward until next fall because clearly this has to be a broad community dialogue. <coughs> uh, get people on board with the need, understanding the need, and figuring out what the right solution is for Arlington that people can coalesce around. Mm -hmm. So that, those are my, uh, that's my presentation tonight. I'm gonna answer any questions the board might have. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> any questions from the board? No, David, Rachel, Ken. Okay, uh, I had promised uh, a couple of people Thanks time to sponsors. speak. Well, Adam is still here, so first I'm going to have uh, Don Seltzer come up. He has a presentation to make. After him, we'll do uh, Steve Revelak, who's also provided materials. And then after that, we'll do it uh, by a show of hands. Yeah, I turned yeah. up the ASA. I'm going to turn it Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. It's pulling right at me, too. You can say the rabbit. <laughs> okay, I'll also speaking about housing in Arlington. Uh, from a slightly different perspective, I'm going to try to focus on what this distinction between Arlington's needs versus oh, Don Seltzer of Yeah, uh, and just just before you start, Don, Don's presentation is available uh, on the ARB's webpage with the materials from our last meeting. So if you'd like to download those for yourself, that's where they're okay. available. So I'm focusing on the distinction between Arlington's needs versus what uh, state agencies are asking of us. I'll start with uh, the number that our town manager uh, um, just gave us, the 185,000 housing units. And it's this week is actually the one year anniversary of when the Metro Mayor's Coalition announced this number. Uh, that same week, Mayor Walsh announced that Boston share will be 69,000 units. And as Adam mentioned, the other communities have been kind of slow to indicate what their um, share of this would be. And it's not really difficult to figure out why they've been reluctant if you do the math. Take away Boston share and you have 116,000 units left for the other 14 communities on a base of 338,000 housing units. This is a 34% increase in the housing for all these 14 communities. <coughs> For Arlington, a 34% increase in housing is just a mind-boggling number. Um, it would mean increasing our housing stock by approximately 6,800 units. And the first question that comes up, where would we put them? The obvious thing would be to put them in our high-density residential areas, the R4 through R8 districts. Right now, we have 5,000 housing units in those districts. And this is 25% of Arlington's housing stock, and it's in just 5% of its land area. We could also consider um, using our business districts, converting them over to housing. Uh, that's a bad idea for a number of reasons. I'll touch on that a little later. We can think out of the box for other solutions. We could fill in Spy Pond and put apartment buildings there. <laughs> uh, actually, that's not so much of a stretch from what's proposed for the wetlands uh, flood zone uh, at the Muga property. Uh, another thing is Winchester Country Club. <laughs> We've got 45 acres there. Beautiful countryside overlooking <coughs> Mystic Lake. Uh, take that <coughs> out. But even if we figure out where we're going to put this housing, the question from day one in these discussions should be, what is going to be the impact of such a population increase on our town's infrastructure? 
and particularly the transportation in schools. I don't have any answers for that right now, but this should be part of a discussion um, all along. Before we simply say we're going to add all this housing, we have to be fighting for what is the impact of that housing, however much it tends to be. I'm going to give you a slightly different perspective. Here is the Metro Mayor's Coalition, 13 cities and two towns, and I've ranked them by their housing density. And if you look here, you can see that Arlington falls into sort of the middle third here of density. But we also have five cities which lie behind us. And posing a question here, what if we asked these five cities to simply build out to Arlington's present density? What would that gain us? And the answer is about 111,000 more housing units in the region, a major dent into our proposed goal for the region. I'm going to carry it a little further. Arlington is also lumped into what's called the inner core communities by the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. And of, uh, there are 20 other communities there besides Arlington. And we happen to fall exactly in the middle as far as density. What if we ask half of the um, inner core 10 um, cities and towns to match our density we would end up with 218,000 more housing units, far more than enough to satisfy Mayor Walsh and his goals. So I'm going to stop for a moment and just throw out some editorial comments. Arlington doesn't have to be ashamed about anything when it comes to housing. We have been doing our share in the region for a long time. What I propose that we focus more on our, what are Arlington's real needs rather than what uh, Mayor Walsh or Governor Baker thinks we should provide. I don't think there's anybody in this room that would argue with that. What we need is more affordable housing. That's what we're lacking. And uh, I'll just briefly mention that coming up. And the other thing which I don't think has received very much attention is that we have to do something about our shrinking commercial base. It's really in a drastic state right now. Just a quick comment on affordable housing. <coughs> I've taken the 1,100 units that are on the state subsidized housing inventory list, and I've broken them down to according to who actually created them. And if you go through the numbers, you find out that five out of six of our affordable units have been produced either by the town itself, through the housing authority, by nonprofits, and uh, only one about one out of six has come from private developers over the years. And of that one out of six, the lion's share of them have come from a single development unit. That's Millbrook Square, 146 units, every one of them affordable. And this was developed 30 years ago. We've done a very little since. In the last 15 years, we've added 53 units under the 15% inclusionary bylaw. Um, those are mostly Sims and Brigham Square. The board is, of course, familiar with all four of these properties. The uh, two on the left here, Broadway and Downing Square, you, you're actually in the final stages of reviewing them. And they were produced by the nonprofit Housing Corporation of Arlington. And we've got 48 apartments, and every one of them is affordable. In contrast, looking at recent private development, here are the first two instances of our mixed use bylaw, where we've ended up with 13 apartments and only a single affordable one in among them. Now I'm just going to shift over to Arlington's commercial base. These are all the communities in Massachusetts that have property tax revenue greater than $100 million. And I've ranked them according to how much of this property tax levy is from non-residential, in other words, commercial business. And we have a number of fortunate communities in the state where they have 50, even 60% of their property tax revenues come from their commercial base. 
I know you can't read the legend on the bottom, but where do you think Arlington ranks in all of these communities? Any guesses? About the middle of the door. Right there at the end. <laughs> we are dead last, and it isn't even close. If we look just among the Metro Mayor's 15, um, collectively, the Metro Mayor's 15 has nearly half of their product, property taxes coming from commercial. And this average is actually being dragged down by Arlington because our commercial base is only 5.6%. What this says is that we're not like the other um, communities of the Metro Mayor's 15. We have a significantly different financial situation because of the lack of our commercial base. And that's why I'm just throwing out this warning that we've got to be careful about converting any more of this commercial tax base to residential. It's going to affect our long-term fiscal liability. Let's do a quick case study, Brigham Square. Uh, many of you in this room remember when this whole section along Mill Street, seven and a half acres, was zoned industrial. Back 25 years ago, half of it was rezoned to B2, and then they came up with a new B2A district two years later. And for years, the town tried to attract commercial um, activity to the site. There was talk of a star market, I believe, for a while. And for whatever reason, the town failed. And what we end up with instead was the Brigham Square housing development that gave us 116 units, 17 of which are affordable. And it also gave us 40 students in Arlington's public schools. So what's the balance sheet of that? The cost to educate those 40 students is $580,000. We only collect $470,000 in property taxes from this property. So we're running a deficit without even counting the other types of town services that they get. We can't follow this path in the future. It's disastrous. So I'm going to echo the town manager's points about how we might address the issue in Arlington. He brought up amendments to inclusionary zoning bylaw. I suggest that the first step should be to eliminate the loopholes that are in the current law and consider ways to increase the percentage of affordable units. This is something we took a try out, try out last spring and didn't work out, but there were some good ideas there and I think we could um, revisit that and figure out how to increase the percentage. As far as housing creation, creation along the commercial corridor, um, number one, we have to protect our existing residents who live there and also the businesses that are there from displacement due to redevelopment. And we also have to look at redevelopment that isn't going to sacrifice our existing commercial base. Accessory dwelling units, that's going to come up again in the future, I know. And I, I ask you, bring back the residential study group to look at. Last spring, you asked them to study it as a sort of a last minute thing. You know that's their purview. They were given one hour to discuss it. They stirred up a lot of the problems with enforcement, unintended consequences. Let them go at it again for an extended time so they can come up with real recommendations of how we implement this if we do. And I'm glad that storm water and climate resiliency was on the town manager's list. Um, you're going to get a lot of resistance from residents if you start attacking landscape open space. Uh, we value our, from a climate point of view, we value our tree canopy. There's no reason why we can't do redevelopment and still preserve some of our trees. And here's a, the last point here. This is one I'm bringing up um, that I've noticed by seeing some problems with stormwater management in town. And that is, right now, our policy for redevelopment is just don't do any worse than you were before. If you buy up a property that's paved from lot line to lot line is completely impervious, you're allowed to go ahead and 
redeveloped the same way. There's no minimum standard. That's a thing we should change. And that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I answer any questions on this? Do you have a Go ahead. Can you go back to the density uh, when you rated all the um, cities and everything else? This one? Uh, this is the Metro Mayor's coalition, the, the density for them. Okay. And uh, So this is based off of uh, square mileage of land, right? That's, uh, how, that's how the density is? Land area. Uh, it subtracts out water area. This is directly from the U.S. Census Bureau data. But it doesn't subtract out parks and, and, uh, and all the other accoutrements that go with that. So if you it look at, like, I, I'm just thinking of Quincy, for example, okay? Yes. Yeah, Quincy. There's the, there's the fells, there's all sorts of, you know, yeah. there's a whole bunch of land there that's not. Well, there are all ways to calculate it. I just went for the most direct. Uh, I didn't calculate these numbers. I took them directly from the U.S. Census Bureau, how they calculate density. And certainly we can go into more I, I think if you yeah. if you take just that out, it would skew this by quite a bit. It might, for some communities, certainly. Okay, and it would, it yeah. would rearrange I, I know in the case of Quincy, 40% uh, of it is actually water area, which is taken out in doing these calculations. The water area, yes, but not the parks. Yeah. Okay, and that's a big deal. And I, I think if we want to present this as true density, we should look at that in that way there because yeah, if, we if we want to do a lot more um, legwork in figuring out these things certainly we could do that way. One thing I want to point out while I'm here, if we take Arlington's density and increased it by 34 percent, we'd be awfully close to what Boston's density is today. Yeah, but you're, okay, that, I'm not going to argue here, Don. Yeah. You're assuming that we're taking the um, taking the, whatever's left over and dividing it up among the, um, the communities. I don't think we have decided that yet. I know. Okay. And, and the I reason think why it's been so difficult for communities is that they look at these numbers and they say, there's no way we can do 34% increase. And if everyone says we can't do anywhere near 34%, we're not going to get anywhere near the 185,000 unit goal. And another thing about that is what the Metro Mayor's Coalition said is that 185,000 units isn't going to bring down housing prices. It's, that's the minimum they think would be required to stabilize the situation. The sobering numbers. Yes, he's going to look at it in, in, a, yeah. in, in a more of a, uh, inclusive way, not just saying this is purely that. You know, Arlington certainly cannot do that 34 percent increase yeah. I think okay there's no way we can do that and no one's talking about that I I, I think we I don't want to lose track of that because because then everybody gets all uh, crazy and we can't do this we, you know, and they throw the you know, they throw the child out with the bath water yeah okay I think there is a responsibility of, of doing some of it we don't know what yet and how yet but we're going to talk about mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. yes yeah. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean that. This is, this is very nice, Don. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Thanks. Don, I'll let you go. I'll have Steve Revelack come up. If anybody has questions for Don, you can ask them when it's your turn to speak. Keep things moving here. Could you provide that entire slideshow to the board? I appreciate it. <laughs> Certainly. Um, no, I Aaron has it as a PDF. Right okay. Now. Yeah, I, I, I didn't realize that before and what you provided to us. So if you could do that, we'll add it to. Uh, I did a lot over the weekend because I was expecting to go before Adam, and so I needed to provide some of the context. Sure. In this one. Yeah. No. And once I, I got started, I just, just kept going. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and there were some good points there. So and uh, so I was also responding to some feedback I got from the board members who sort of hinted that. Maybe these then spreadsheets that I'd started with are not the way to present it. So <laughs> I, I, I took them all out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Steve. Uh, hello, Steve Rebelock, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. So uh, I'm here to talk about Town Day. Uh, so a group of us had approached uh, Envision Arlington about collaborating on a Town Day activity, uh, a housing survey. So our idea was to, you know, the idea we pitched uh, was to have a sort of a public engagement kind of activity that got people thinking about housing and also gave us the opportunity to gather some input from, uh, from the community. 
So I volunteered at Envision's Town Day booth, and I'm presenting these results as a you know a volunteer who worked in the booth. So this is a, as an individual rather than on behalf of you know any organization or whatever. So the survey consisted of six poster boards, uh, each containing a housing-related issue. Uh, so the, the part people who participated were given three little adhesive dots, and we asked them to put them on the board uh, that corresponded to the issue that was most important to them. Uh, we also had uh, a supply of you know pens and uh, post-it notes, you know, so that people had the opportunity to write comments and put them on the board as well. So uh, roughly 339 people participated, uh, and what you're seeing there is a total of about 1,017 dots on different boards and stickies. So my, uh, my written report goes through these in order. They, uh, you know, kind of just as they appear, I'm going to jump around a little bit. So based on, um, you know, Based on the dots, uh, housing affordability came out as a prevailing issue with uh, 308. Um, now, having read the written comments, I get the sense that affordability means very different things to different people, and there are very different ideas about how to address this. Uh, so, for example, one of the comments was, we don't need more housing, we just need to make what we have less affordable, or make it affordable, less expensive. Um, on the other end of the spectrum were, was a request for uh, more multifamily housing, transit-oriented development, and a red line extension. So there's a lot, there's a lot of ground between those two views, although they're both trying to get to the same place. Uh, social justice came out in the second, as second with 197, so that's our top tier, uh, affordability and social justice. Uh, the middle tier consisted of lifestyle options, which was 149, and doing more with existing resources, which was 143. Uh, to fill out the bottom, uh, we're setting a 10-year goal for housing production, that got 119, and maximizing flexibility of home space uh, with 81. All right, so then some observations, um, you know, based on, you know, compiling this, and, you know, again, these are coming from me as an individual. Um, people seem most concerned about affordability, uh, which is to say the cost of housing. Um, you know, housing costs in Arlington have, and in, and in the metro Boston area, <clears throat> have kind of been going up on an, in an escalator ride for close to 20 years. And, you know, so this, you know, seeing this concern I think is understandable. Uh, there was some appetite for bringing back rent control. Now, state law doesn't al allow us to do much in this area unless we wanted to look at a voluntary uh, program, or at least that's my plain language reading of the Massachusetts Rent Control Prohibition Act. Uh, so there's some recognition of the importance of older, naturally affordable apartment buildings. Now, Arlington, you know, back in the 50s and 60s was a pretty pro-growth place. We built tons of apartments, and that's fortunate because, you know, it, you know, it allowed those buildings to be built in the first place. Uh, the downside is we have not, you know, kept putting more of them into the pipeline. So as the, you know, our stock gets older, at some point it's gonna to have to be refurbished, renovated, upgraded, and that may lead it to be more expensive. All right, so um, could you go skip forward to a yep. couple of slides? Look for one with a pie chart. Like the next to last page. Yep, that's it. So we're giving, I also did, tried to do a little bit of devil's advocate reasoning about affordability. And part of it was uh, this question, uh, which comes from Envision Arlington's last survey. And the question asks, you know, what was your household income in 2018? So the largest group of responses was more than, uh, more than $200,000 per household. And 71 of the respondents indicated having a household of $100,000 or more per year. So I knew we were in a fluent community. I didn't quite realize that we were that affluent. Um, but you know, this goes back to the escalator. Um, you know, we've had steadily increasing home prices year, year after year. So new residents who come to town have to make a little more than a new resident who came to town you know, last year. You know, combine that with the, um, you know, the term residential turnover with the last 15 to 20 years. And I, I, think, I think it is fair to say that we've done a lot of, you know, we've done, we've, We've gentrified quite a bit. Um, you know, it's been, you know, there's not, been no fanfare. It's just, you know, the people who move in are the people who can afford to move in. I mean, this hasn't been completely bad because in, 
in a, in a sense, you know, we're able to do things like rebuild schools, rebuild town buildings, improve staffing, et, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we have, I think, solid financial management on the town side, and that helps, but, you know, you need capital to do that, that sort of thing. So, I mean, despite the housing costs, you know, there's part of our, part of our status quo kind of works, at least for, you know, part of the population. You know, that's the pro side to it. Uh, the con side is that, you know, there are, you know, there is, um, you know, there is the issue of pricing people out. Um, I think there's been some, I'm, I'm, I'd be completely surprised if there hadn't, hasn't been some sort of level of displacement. Um, you know, and just, you know, our kind of our metro, metro growth pa patterns, we're also running into traffic congestion, and of course we have the regional housing demands. So, in summary, um, I thought this was a, a nice, a nice activity, a good opportunity to talk to people, uh, and I see this as the beginning of what's like probably going to be a very long conversation. But I'm glad to see us getting that conversation started, and I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Anyone have questions for Steve? Go ahead. Uh, well, I, I just want to uh, didn't have a question for you specifically, Steve. Just wanted to say to Adam and Don and, and Steve, thank you very much for, for coming and, and presenting all this valuable information. Uh, Adam, um, uh, especially, um, I'm uh, reassured um, to hear what you had to say tonight um, and uh, feel like um, the town's taking a, a measured approach to this and, and recognizing that that uh, we need solutions that work for Arlington, um, regardless of what the Metro Mayor's Coalition may be thinking. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as Don pointed out, um, Arlington and, and the other communities uh, that he talked about uh, are each unique and, and uh, we need to find solutions that uh, work well for Arlington, uh, optimize um, uh, the, the space and the opportunities that we, that we have and, uh, and are supported uh, by the citizens of the, of the town. Uh, and, uh, and I'm glad that we're starting a process that's going to uh, generate ideas um, largely um, from the citizens um, to, to figure out exactly what what those issues are, what problems are we actually trying to solve, and what are the options on the table to, to address those problems, uh, and, then, and then which ones are we going to be able to move forward with that, that people are, are going to be on board with, and that will actually work. In, in Arlington, and if we, you know, if we disappoint the Metro Mayor's Coalition, uh, you know, that that's okay, um, as long as we do uh, what's right for for Arlington. Okay. Thank you, David. Barbara, I submitted a written report to you on October first, and I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to give you. Great summary. Could you? I know who you are, but could you state oh. your name and address for the record? My name please? is Barbara Thornton, and my address is 223 Park Ave in Arlington, and I'm on precinct 16. Shall I talk about the president going? <coughs> First, Don. Nice job. That was a great <laughs> presentation. Um, do you want me to? Leave this with you, or do you have I'll it? Take it. Jenny I think we have it, but I'll take Jenny it has it already. I'm going to yeah. revise it with some more information. Um, basically, I'm here to say I hope you will be bold. I hope you will consider yourselves as part of a bigger region, and look for uh, beyond just Massachusetts examples of how we can solve as as members of a region uh, the problems that we have in front of us here in Arlington. Um, I, the report that I just submitted to you has three examples pulled from a book written by uh, David Rusk, who writes about cities and suburbs, and, ah, and he is uh, uh, co-founder of the uh, uh, 
a zoning, some an organization that looks at zoning nationally every 10 years. He gets the census data together. He looks at like hundreds of municipalities, crunches the numbers, and figures out what works. What works is when a broader governance works together, like the regional co coalition. That is what works for mun individual municipalities within <laughs> a given region. And I, I wanted to just jump ahead, to, uh, building on something that Don said uh, about the, the importance of us not having a strong commercial tax base. One of the things that, one of the examples that you'll see in the report that I submitted uh, from Mr. Rusk is the example of uh, uh, Minnesota, the fiscal let's see, the fiscal di disparities plan in Minnesota, where they actually take money from the richer commercial tax base municipalities and redistribute it to those com communities that don't have such a rich commercial tax base. It is just random that Cambridge is a so damn filthy rich. But, you know, it is what it is. I think our responsibility here in Arlington is just what is our part in the region? What is our role? What is our responsibility? Uh, are we doing our part? And what does it mean to do our part as a part of the region? And how can that benefit us? And I think the evidence shows that if we act as part of a region, it does benefit Arlington more directly than if we tried to do it alone. And that's all I have. Thank yeah. you. Barbara. Yes. Uh, that example um, where they were redistributing uh, co uh, commercial tax revenue. Yes. Was that in the context uh, of, of an area that had uh, functioning counties and, and uh, that, well, the, that provided the, county the county, services? The county issue is a, is a big issue. This was actually, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about in the county context. Um, you have to look at the, it's number three of the example that I gave you, and they probably have counties, but I don't think, as I read it, and, and I actually talked to David Rusk about it, and it doesn't have to be limited to counties, it can be a, it can be some kind of an amalgamation of municipalities that come together and even have a special purpose organization that focuses on land use and zoning issues, for example, or that, for example. We did 40B. It's not a county issue. Yeah. But there are things that we can <coughs> learn from that particular example and then bring back here. So, so I'm curious, Adam, is that, is that something that the Metro Mayor's Coalition has discussed? And it, that kind of a concept? <coughs> uh, to help the communities that don't have a commercial tax base? So it, it's something that I've brought up at Metro Mayor's Coalition meetings, MAPC meetings, MMA, Mass Municipal Association meetings. The challenge we have, I, I don't know the demographics of that area in Minnesota that Barbara mentioned. The challenge is, you, so you saw on Don's map, I think Everett had the most, it had the highest percentage of uh, commercial, then it was Cambridge after that, and I, I didn't pick up the rest of them. So I saw a lot of gateway cities in there. Yeah. And you would break it down into an argument where you're saying, city that has a significant proportion of low-income children give money to Arlington in Melrose. And it, it's a political it's loser. Yeah. Yeah. So I think and from an equity point of view, I'm, I'm on board, right? Because we, we, have, we have wealth in this community, as Steve demonstrated, with mm -hmm. the people who have been moving into town. But that wealth is only accessed via overrides. Whereas communities like Cambridge, Everett, Brockton, yeah. all of River Lawrence, they have commercial tax bases, but their population doesn't have the ability to pay. Yeah. And it's also, uh, you can't just look at what the commercial tax base as a whole is, because uh, industry in Everett is very different from industry in Cambridge. Yes, yes. Um, so I, I mean, I, I, go ahead. I'm, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I, I do think they're, they're could be, should be some model. I'm not sure if it's a direct community to community model or if it's a more overall progressive tax structure where the state's collecting tax revenues in a different manner and distributing them differently than it does now. But I, I do think the inequities of Prop 2 and a half in terms of communities with commercial bases and those that don't is something that, in all of this, has to be more seriously looked at. I, I was just going to say that I appreciate that you brought up the 
um, correlation too between what, what Steve and John just presented as well and the opportunity that we have to perhaps extract some of that the, the wealth and the opportunity that we do have here within a within a growing um, commercial <coughs> base which which you suggested as well I think that there's just um, a correlation that's right there in front of us that yeah. mm -hmm. is important for us to really dive into yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Patricia And um, thank you, Mr. Seltzer, for your very careful presentation. The only housing Arlington needs is affordable housing, in addition to some elderly housing. That is, according to available information, including Arlington's master plan, Arlington affordable housing is increased best by leveraging funds that we can easily access to purchase existing buildings and residences for renovation for affordable um, housing um, and um, such funds include CPA, CDBG, federal home funds and others. That strategy will work even better if we establish an affordable housing trust fund increased linkage fees for developers and real estate transfer tax transfer fees the inclusion rezoning only by law helps but we need to counteract developers gaming that system Arlington Redevelopment Board um, might be able hopefully to better protect houses like the Atwood House for use as affordable housing Arlington needs more commerce and business we should not change zoning to enable more market rate and luxury residential units, costing more in services, including schools, than tax revenue that they bring in. Our residential real estate taxes are 94.4% of tax revenue. That is by far the highest of all metro communities. Our non-residential share is only 5.6%. Whereas Boston and um, area um, communities have non-residential tax share of 47%, which is nine times higher than ours, we cannot afford to burden Arlington residential taxpayers further with confiscatory real estate taxes to provide housing for wealthier municipalities. 39% of Arlington residents are renters. Let us spend more than 30% of income for rent, even though Arlington rentals cost less than Somerville, Cambridge, Belmont, Winchester, and sometimes less than government subsidized rates. For instance, for a one bedroom unit in Arlington, the rent is just about, just above $1,400. For a similar unit in Brookline, the rent is over $1,700. A new unit in either case is much more at between $2,000 and $2,500. If we permit massive new construction of mixed use buildings, then many renters who cannot afford newly constructed units would be displaced or evicted. In Boston, evictions last year reached 43 evictions per day. We could have a tsunami of cries for help, which Arlington, Arlington cannot deal with. The resources of Arlington Housing Authority um, and nonprofits, for example, the Housing Corporation of Arlington, would be overwhelmed with a tragic increase. Likely, hundreds of displaced families threatened with homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. Let's stay up here too. Um, I have a few points. I'm going to try to make them very quick. Uh, so one point is about the schools. So I think just to be intellectually honest, we talk about the cost for each additional student to a school. We can't talk about the average cost for educating Arlington students. We have to talk about the enrollment growth factor, which is next year is going up to 50%. So 
so it's about 7,000. So if you look at sort of the cost to Arlington of adding an additional student, it's about 7,000. Of course, um, there's extra costs for health care and so forth, but we also get Chapter 70 money, and that is potentially going up. So, you know, probably about 7,000 is probably a pretty accurate number in terms of the additional costs to educate an Arlington student. Um, I actually am supporting additional housing, not in spite of the effect on schools, but because of the effects on schools. What I'm worried about is current trends in Arlington. I don't want Arlington to become a town, which I think people say Lexington is, where people move in with toddlers and move out when their kids go to college. And I think we're heading in that direction. Um, I'm concerned about the loss of housing diversity in town. Um, you know, all of those, those apartments that became condos means that younger people who have, don't have kids in the school system can't afford to live in Arlington anymore. 1990, 20% of Arlington's population was between the ages of 30, 20 and 34. So the, you know, in Arlington we have older parents. People generally don't have kids in the school system before 34. Um, now it is 17%. In, sorry, near 2010, 17% probably even lower now. During the same time period, the population over 65 dropped from 18% to 16%. So what I am concerned about is loss of housing diversity. What I want is smaller units. I want units that where a senior can downsize and stay in Arlington. One of the most prominent opponents of new housing in Arlington is actually looking to downsize an old person in the community, but he hasn't found anything in Arlington. He's talking about going to Cambridge. And we've, I've encountered many people like that, going to Cambridge, going to Burlington, because there just isn't the kind of housing that they're looking for in Arlington. Um, similarly, people you know who have younger kids may not need a bigger housing. There's just very little available in Arlington. So we know that to support the schools economically, what we want are a bunch of people in town who don't have kids in the school system. We don't want an ever-increasing number of the town to be just people with kids in the school system at that moment. We want them to stay in Arlington after the kids move on. We want them to come to Arlington before their kids get in. And so I'm, that's why I'm supporting housing. Um, the other point I just want to briefly make is that I'm passionate about process. And um, I've sent some messages to some of you. Um, I'm glad it feels like we're take, you're taking this process seriously. It takes a year in Arlington to have an open, honest dialogue about things, to make the community comfortable with things, to get ideas from the community. And I just urge you to trust that process. You're, you're going to get a lot of different voices. And one of the things I think is really valuable about this open dialogue is that people who have a per particular opinion realize when they're in the room with a bunch of different people that there's actually a wide variety of opinion in town. You, know, you tend to live within your small groups, me included, and you don't realize how many ideas, how many diversity opinions, and being in a big open room and talking about these things over and over again, you find out how much, how much diversity of opinion there is in Arlington. So I'm glad you're taking that process seriously. I urge you to not go to the community first with a solution, but to go with the issue and the problems and raise those questions. So don't present a plan first. <laughs> that would lose you a lot of goodwill. Um, it seems like you're not doing that at this time, which is great. Um, and yeah, so I'm just excited about that. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Two. I actually printed out what I, a draft of what I was going to say, so there's plenty of comments, and I've given an electronic version to Jenny so that you can all have it for the event. My name is Patrick Hanlon. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 5. I live at 20 Park Street. Um, also, I'm a member, associate member of the Board of Zoning Appeals, or excuse me, the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, and a member of the Residential uh, Study Group. Um, I actually came expecting that this would be a fire, more fiery meeting than it is, and I think that that's one terrific thing that has happened. It was pretty fiery at times last spring, uh, but I thought that, th and do think that the conversation on all sides tonight has been open. It has been thoughtful. Uh, it certainly is this kind of conversation that you can carry on and that you can maybe get something there with. And I think that is a tremendous, a tremendous step forward. Ultimately, the objective here is to have a well-conceived, well-supported, and well-explained response to however we define the problem, whether it's partly the regional housing crisis, partly it's a question of affordable housing, which isn't strictly a matter of the regional housing crisis, and partly it's a matter of lack of diversity in housing space. 
those of you who know me, if they, if they had seen me last year, instead of standing up here and nervously walking around, I would be nervously hopping around because I had a serious problem with a hip, which I have since discarded for a new one. The, at that point, I suddenly realized that living in a house with four different levels on it was not possibly going to take me into my 80s. It did okay into the mid-70s, but, you know, it, it, eventually it's going to catch up with me, and eventually I'm going to be looking for some place that's a reasonable place on one floor, and if you look around at the opportunities to do that in Arlington, uh, it's small. So you're looking at basically thinking possibly of getting of having to lead for the community. So diversity, not just for senior people, but for other people matters a lot. And that's not just an affordable issue, that's a matter of just having a supply of what the, of a diversity of options at every price point, which is language that's taken directly from the housing production plan, and it's already our policy to try to achieve that. Um, I think that, that one of the things that's emerged from this discussion is an openness to not just start from where we left off or almost, but to go back to the drawing board and think about what it is that is our goal and what are the best ways of going about and, and getting that goal. Um, I started thinking it was really important to have an integrated view and a comprehensive view of various ways of addressing the housing issues that we have. It's not all about housing production. It certainly is not all about zoning. Um, what Mrs. Warden has come up with, I think, are all things that need to be considered. The same thing is true of Don, and that's one of the reasons why it's a great thing that Adam is going to marry you together with the select board to look at this in a comprehensive way and not treat this as a zoning issue primarily, but as a housing issue which has a zoning component. But it has other components as well, and the community needs to look at that um, in general. I think that that when we get into the further into the discussion, and as this discussion has indicated, there are a number of questions which I think need to be addressed, and addressed as clearly and as transparently uh, as possible. One is how would prudential solutions actually affect housing production? What would get produced? A zoning change applies to nonprofit developers as well as for-profit developers. And th if there are restrictions there that are not reasonable, they affect everyone. So what would we do about that? Um, what would we do? do we how much do we imagine inclusionary zoning can get for us? Uh, how, what proportion of our effort should be in the area of uh, expanding funding or, ex or facilitating in some way? Um, all affordable housing or, housing or mostly affordable housing. And beneath, beneath all of that, there's a question of what does it mean to be affordable housing? There's the capital A affordable housing that enables something to go on to the SHI, but there's also a more general concept of affordability as well. We need to look at the financial implications on the town, as everybody has already done. Uh, what is the implication for schools? What is the implication for the tax base and so forth? Lots of discussion. That's something that we're going to need to reason through to a sensible, uh, a sensible consensus or almost consensus. Um, to what extent do we imagine that if we have more affordable housing or more housing in general, more multifamily housing, to what extent is that going to involve redevelopment of housing that already exists? And that may be already affordable to, at least small affordable, to a lot of people. If you redevelop that and you get inclusionary zoning ordinances, what you may find is hollowing out the middle, where you have housing that's available for more affluent people, housing that is available for less affluent people, and in the middle, what you've lost is housing that is affordable to people in the middle, and maybe those are also people that we want to have in our town in order to preserve uh, diversity. And finally, it's important to look, not just finally, because there is no finally in this discussion, but we want to look at it broadly at environmental considerations. Part of what goes on when you have a reasonable housing shortage is people move far away and then they commute in. How do they go in? They go on in along Route 2, which is on the border of Arlington. They come in on 993, which is going down just barely uh, off the... When you look to add the state's look at the six most congested areas in Massachusetts, 
most of them are really close to Arlington. So we don't really benefit when they build a lot of new housing out further out, even though it's denser, if those people have to come through our community. We certainly don't benefit when they spew carbon dioxide into the air and contribute to greenhouse, greenhouse gases problems. So we need to look broadly at environmental, and we also need to look very specifically. We need to understand where are we not going to be willing to make the, those trade-offs in wetlands or in stormwater, where is it that we're not going to be making those trade-offs? And even more important is, where is it that with imaginative planning and imaginative engineering, we can figure out solutions that enable the conflict or the potential conflict between environmental and housing objectives to be resolved and maybe even to have a, uh, a solution that is better for everyone. So there's lots of questions to be asked and they need to be asked in a way that doesn't presuppose we already know the answers, because we don't know the answers. But we do need to figure out just what it is that is reasonable for us to be contributing to our regional problem, and then we have to find the will to do that. And that's going to require good faith, and it's going to require discussions and cooperation on all sides. And this has been a pretty good meeting in, imagine, in persuading me, at least, that all of that is, is possible, and I hope that it actually happens. Thank you. Mr. Lurie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Lurie. Uh, I was wondering if I could ask the town manager a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. you. Yes. Um, one, on the Metro Mayor's Coalition, had a, the town manager had a nice slide that showed how um, housing demand follows job growth. And <coughs> I'm wondering, as the uh, Mayor's Coalition looked into reducing job growth, why don't we just job growth in the area? And I think, you know, that's, that's actually part of the problem is most of the Mayors, they're elected politicians who are appointed by their uh, city councils. And um, we're basically at full employment right now. Within the Commonwealth itself, there are certainly other gateway cities that could uh, benefit far more from both the job growth and the housing growth and have the capability to do it and to increase housing at a much lower cost. Yet there, the political consideration is that an elected politician will never say, we don't need more jobs. They really need to start thinking about that um, and distributing. I, I think the mayor's coalition is too small. And the, as someone said, we need to look at this regionally, but we need to look at it in a much more broader region. But my other question, though, is, is locally. Um, and I thought, I've heard a few people tonight talk about the increased tax revenue um, that new development brings. Um, someone told me, and I I don't want to mention his name, but I think he's a good authority, that one selectman has created a spreadsheet that has shown that the town can build its way out of its spending problems. And that is, if we build enough new, um, do enough new development, we won't have to be doing our um, you know, continued overrides every few years. And I'm just wondering if you know anything about that and you can comment, comment on that. So I've never seen that spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. We've modeled a lot of spreadsheets and we, we've never, I think there's no amount of commercial or housing growth or expense cutting that takes us out of our structural deficit that we want. Thanks. Thank you. Others? To speak. <clears throat> well, thank you. That was a really positive discussion. Um, thank you, Adam, for thank coming you. and uh, thanks for arranging this. It's the first of many, um, and I do intend to have this be a more conversational, open process than the us versus them that occurred last year. I'm hoping that the folks in this room can get on board with that and come up with constructive solutions <coughs> to the things that were outlined. Um, we'll continue this, this dialogue as, as things go on. So thank you all. Appreciate it. I'm sure some people will leave. I know Adam has to head back to the select board. We have additional okay. business over by the to transact and discuss. We're still, done? We're still in the process of finding that yeah. joint right Would you mind yeah. following yeah. up on that uh, yeah. thing and uh, 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 calculating. calculating that? Um, if you can give me some right. guidance, how to. I apologize, yes. Let's talk after. Are you going to be around? I can't make you sure. Okay.
I, if, 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 we have additional we have business, business and, and none of us want to stay all night, so if you're going to leave, that's please do so quietly so we can keep things well, moving here. All right, I was still holding that thing. That so, next up we have uh, <laughs> appointment of the Arlington Heights Neighborhood <laughs> Action Plan Implementation Committee. Mouthful. And I know I think we have the two uh, nominees, appointees here, so if I could ask both of you to come up. Uh, thank you for your interest in these seats and this committee. I always appreciate seeing new faces. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to go from left to right and have you introduce yourself, my left to right. Uh, have you introduce yourself, tell us why you're interested in being part of this committee, and uh, what brings you here this evening? Sure. Um, my name is Jason Forney, and I live at 545 Summer Street. Um, I've lived in Arlington Heights for um, since 2008. Um, I love my neighborhood, um, but I'd like to see it. It seems like there are some opportunities to make it much better um, through planning. Um, I am a design and planning professional, um, specifically an architect. I um, have about 20 years of experience um, working on a range of project types, higher education, mixed use, um, currently working on a 100% affordable 40-unit um, project in Cambridge, Porter Square. Um, and so I um, am interested in lending a hand and um, using my, you know, professional skills to um, uh, contribute to the implementation process of the plan that's in place. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Rob Davison. Uh, I live on Tanager Street in the Heights. I was born in Arlington and was raised here and went through the public schools. I've lived in Arlington for most of my life. Um, I'm a corporate creative director, so we have something in common there. Um, uh, I also uh, am a visiting faculty member at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Um, so I have uh, I enjoy working with multidisciplinary teams on brainstorming and kind of taking uh, conceptual strategy through to implementation. So I kind of enjoy that process. Uh, I frequent the Heights Business District a lot, and I see lots of opportunities for enhancement and improvement. Uh, I uh, lived in Brighton uh, previously, and I enjoyed kind of seeing the transformation of the Brighton Business Districts through the Brighton Main Street program, and enjoy visiting different municipalities and seeing how they've evolved their business districts from Pittsfield to other places uh, outside the country even. Uh, so I would like to use my professional experience as well to try to drive the plan forward and improve the heights. Okay. Great. Thank you. Jane, do you have anything to add? Uh, just to add that um, I, I put the memo in the packet which outlines that we had a very <laughs> a very big response, more than I think we've ever had to any committee we've ever <laughs> assembled. So Great. it's a very popular, um, very, there's a lot of interest in the planning process. There's a lot of interest in the plan itself um, for those people who would not be, because there's only technically two spots that we said we would fill, that you would fill through this committee. Um, there's many other people who I hope will stay engaged. There will be, we, we would intend to have a community process, which I've outlined in the memo that you know, there will be some sort of engagement event that's up to the committee to figure out those next steps. Um, also, uh, some people in the community have commented on the fact that the plan, at the, while the plan was being developed, we were also in the midst of preparing for Spring Town Meeting, which talked about specific zoning issues that we are obviously not pursuing at this time. However, there are many other things in that plan that are worth, um, you know, a lot of attention and time and uh, the devotion of this committee to explore, which includes non zone uh, items that don't have to do with zoning and have to do more with placemaking and programmatic issues and business development and creation. Um, so I, I hope that the committee continues to explore that while also thinking about the other zoning recommendations that are not tied to spring town meeting that are also recommended after a very um, thorough analysis of the very specific area in Arlington Heights. Uh, so I, I just want this board to be aware of the fact that there's more to that plan than the one thing that's been discussed. I, I know you are mostly aware of that, but we haven't spent mm -hmm. a lot of time talking through that plan. And when we agreed to create this committee, um, we, we talked about sort of what they would be doing and, and how it relates back to that plan, but also that there would be some continued engagement that would be occurring. So, um, so for the people who do not get appointed this evening, I hope that there's continued involvement and interest and 
passion and pursuit for the Heights <laughs> to make it the best place possible. Mm -hmm. That's why we wanted to do this work. We were actually being responsive to many neighbors in Arlington Heights who were who came together a few years ago actually and really encouraged the town to do something about Arlington Heights, forming support Arlington Heights, which led to a hundred person meeting that we held actually in the summer a couple of years ago. And I, I hope that that inspiration stays and so I, uh, I appreciate your interest, of course, in the committee. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, sure. uh, and there's a whole slate of people, of course, that would be appointed as part of this, mm -hmm. not just these um, two individuals. And is there someone from the board that's going to sit on this as well? well that, that was something we talked about, but you would need to make that appointment as part of this process okay. or designation. The designation is a first appointment. Yeah. Okay. So do any of you have questions for these two gentlemen? No, I think you're both very qualified to be on the commission. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, too, live in the Heights, and Rachel lives in the Heights, and Ken lives close to the Heights. So we all <laughs> are, are invested in this proce project, this process, and seeing how it goes through, and, and uh, seeing how the conversations take place in a more uh, contained <coughs> arena than town-wide zoned by a lot of changes. So, um, Thank you. We appreciate you being willing to, to step up and uh, donate your time, which I'm sure you'll be doing a lot of in the next <coughs> few years. So with that, I think I would hear a motion to appoint this slate uh, of people, including Jason and Robert. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Congratulations. Thank Look you. forward to seeing more of you both. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both. Right, so, yes. Do we want to designate someone from this board to sit on yeah, that committee? We do. Um, I'll give it up to. I'll let you two flip a coin. Yeah. No, no. I'll, I nominate Rachel. I would be happy to sit on. Perfect. That. Okay. So, nominate Rachel Zemberry to sit on the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan Implementation Committee. So, so motion. Sorry. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All right. That's so what you want, right? What's that? That's what you want, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we have uh, open forum left. If you've already spoken on housing tonight, please uh, talk about something else. <laughs> we heard you. And, uh, we're happy to hear it. So if anyone has any other concerns, comments, questions, Anything they'd like to talk about related to the ARB, please go ahead, Mr. Loretti. I was playing with Chris Loretti down the street. I, I have a request for the board, and that is I, I would ask the board to clarify what its policy is about listing correspondence received on its agendas. Um, I think at a meeting back in July, I handed you at the meeting um, some suggested changes, some suggested zoning changes, these primary clarifications to the bylaw. Um, now, obviously, since I handed them to you that night, they couldn't have been on the agenda for that night. But I would have expected, like any correspondence you had received through the mail or by email you know, any time that they get listed on the agenda in the correspondence received category. Um, if indeed the correspondence received is only correspondence related to agenda items, um, then I think that needs to be clear. Or if it's selected correspondence received, and that's what the selectmen do, then, uh, then I think that should be noted as well. But generally, if a board is having a correspondence received, I expect that any correspondence they receive gets listed there. Doesn't mean you necessarily act on it, uh, but just that you acknowledge that you've received it. And you know, the same thing happened last week when I sent an email objecting to the lack of open space, total lack of open space at the um, development on Broadway that the Housing Corporation brought before you. Again, I realized it wasn't sent in time to be listed in the agenda when the agenda was printed, but it didn't show up this week in the correspondence received either. So I would just ask that um, somehow you know, on your website or elsewhere you make it clear um, when you are or whether you are including all correspondence received in that listing of the agendas. Thank you. Anyone else? It's all of our business for this evening, unless anyone has anything else they'd like to discuss. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.